I, my name is Li Ping Zhou from Peking University in China. And uh, it's a great honor to have a distinguished speaker today, who is Dr. Pradeem and Srivastava from India. Uh, <laughs> Pradeem is actually a member in the SSC in, of Pages, and he works in the Indian Institute of Technology and the Wadia Institute of Himalaya Geology, India. And the Pradeem is, uh, was trained as a fluvial sedimentologist, a geomorphologist, and a luminance dating specialist. And he tries to understand the tectonic evolution and the river responses to climate change of different timescales in quaternary. And uh, so today he's going to tell us what he has learned about the flood history of the Himalaya, a geologist perspective. Now, Pradeem. Thank you, Professor Lai Chao. And it was, it is an, definitely an honor to be part of the Pages OSM and uh, to be able to give this plenary talk. And uh, I now request the tech support to share my slides. Okay, uh, should I do it from at my end? Yeah, you can you can do it from your side, yes. Okay. Are my slides visible, sir? That looks fine, yes. Okay, yeah. so uh, thank you once again. And uh, greetings to all, all the people, all scientists and students who are attending this session. And uh, the thing which I am going to present is uh, really represents my last two, three years of work with my students in Himalayas. And uh, this is something which actually started in 2013 when India really got struck up with, uh, with very large flood and thousands of people were killed and billions of eco worth economy was lost. And that made me uh, travel all across Indus, Brahmaputra, and Ganga River systems of Himalaya with all the students. But then, exploring the literature, I realized that the globally, you see that most of the South Africa, Southern Asia, and some part of the South American continent is, is at the global, I mean, is at the real risk of floods. And the mortality is also concentrated in the Southern part of the uh, I mean, globe. Largely, it's because of the higher concentration of the population, but also you can see that the, the, I mean, the, overall, the largest disaster in terms of the losses is flooding globally. And this makes me feel that probably the branch line concept is still holding there in terms of when we see the global disasters like flood. And, and this probably is the reason why, I mean, these countries which are actually lying south of these branch line largely do not have data base that can serve the informed policy, right? Of, and of course, large part of China has some data, some part of South Africa and some, some very little part of uh, South American uh, rivers have been studied in terms of the flood history. So here in this talk, I'm going to present some data what we have generated or we, what we have actually understood in this Himalaya. And you can see that Himalaya actually hosts few of the very large river systems like the Ganga, the Brahmaputra, the Yangtze, and the Indus. And this, these four or five river systems actually support one, uh, along, somewhere around one, to one by fifth uh, part of the global population. And <clears throat> You see this formation of Himalaya, which one of my students made, made this uh, movie. You can see it's a sandbox model that it, it is actually is composed of several thrust sheets lying over one, one over the other. And as the Indian plate moves, this Himalaya actually keeps on achieving a particular kind of an of a orography. 
and this is how a, this profile of the Himalayas looks like. If you see the southern front of the Himalayas, which is the, at the exit of River Ganga, and as we go to Karakoram and southern part of the Tibet, this is how the geomorphic profiles look like. Looks like it it keeps on approaching, uh, achieving a little elevation from Himalayan frontal thrust in the south. And at, as you move up, we have main boundary thrust, and then all of a sudden the gradient picks up at main central thrust, where the relief becomes very, really very large. And at the same time, if you see the rainfall rainfall profile over this geomorphic system, you can see the first uh, rainfall high lies just above the main boundary thrust, which is the uh, physiographic transition one in terms of geomorphology. And the second rainfall high lies just above the main central thrust, which is again the physiographic transition too. Now let us see, this was how, I mean, the headwaters of Ganga were looking like when we had a flood of 2013. Somewhere around 6,000 people died and 500 million worth of US dollars economy was lost. What we did, we started moving in, in, in large part of the Ganga Basin and uh, we, we were trying to understand the damage elements like, like the landslide, the uh, river bank erosion, like the damages in bridges and culverts and roads. These are the things. And to give one example, you can see that these are the landslides alone in the Ganga Valley. We had around 700 plus landslides which were activated or reactivated. And these landslides, if you see, form a certain kind of a cluster. And this cluster basically is conforming these to these two physiographic transitions. Physiographic transition one lies in this southern part of the uh, catchment, and physiographic two lies just above this. So this, what we came to know that probably there is an element of uh, predictability in terms of damage when a flood of magnitude that we experienced in 2013 strikes to Himalayas. So this is one thing which we learned, but I mean, we know now that probably we are, we can lay our hands on certain kinds of uh, uh, damage zones, which can be predictable, but we do not know what, what is the recurrence interval of these floods? What are the magnitudes of these floods and where do they, do they erode and what actually forces these floods? So to understand this, we, we started looking for flood archives. And these are one of the very simplest uh, flood, flood driven proxy deposits. Like you can see that this is one sand and silt couplet. One the sandier part is rippled often by a sandy, parallel laminated sand. It is capped by a clay silt uh, cap. And this one couplet represents one flood. And this sand part is normally deposited on the rising limb of the flood, and the clay part is deposited when you have a waning flood. So that is, that is how if you find certain kinds of sequences where you have a stack of flood deposits or a stack of these clay silt couplets lying over each other, you can you are actually seeing a flood history. And that is these kinds of the deposits we actually targeted, okay? So now I'll take you, I'll, I'll give you a few examples from the two major river systems, like this, this the Brahmaputra that drains towards east and the Brahm and the Ganga, uh, sorry, Indus that drains towards the west. And this is all. This is the southern edge of the Tibet and beyond the northern flood, uh, northern front of the Himalayas. You see, this is the river profile, longitudinal river profile of Indus, and this is the longitudinal profile of the uh, Brahmaputra or the Sanko, right? So if you join, because these two river systems are overlapping to each other, it is, it is, it is all. I mean, we can see that if we join these two river profiles side by side, what we see actually the Tibetan part in the Indus lying somewhere around 5,000 plus meters. And whereas in, in that in the Brahmaputra part actually goes down to somewhere around 3,000, around 3,000 meters above sea level. And this part of the Southeastern Tibet uh, actually receives rainfall as high as, as high as one meters per annum. Whereas this part of the Himalay uh, in, uh, in Indus Basin receives rainfall of less than 100 millimeters per year. So there is an order of magnitude 
difference in the landfall in the rainfall and of course there is a difference in the continental scale geomorphology this part lies 5000 meters above the sea level and this part is actually goes towards the equator because the himalaya is forming an arch is goes goes towards the equator and also it has a lower elevation actually tibetan plateau is dipping towards the east and this actually explains the magnitude of the floods that two river systems actually experience these are the flood stacks in indus in the right hand upper corner you can see the flood deposits are of sub centimeter centimeter scales whereas in brahmaputra you can see the one shot deposit is around 15 meters or so so this 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 explains the order of magnitude of the flood that two these two river systems experience and these differences is actually are being controlled by the continental scale geomorphology and this is something what i was uh, talking about a geologist per perspective in terms of understanding of flood origin and the flood magnitude in himalayas right and in in another another story that goes along with these floods and if you are fortunate enough we find sometimes within these flood deposits stacks of flood deposits we find the human remains not human remains exactly but imprints of the humans they are these are the big layers that are the archaeological uh, locales and they are, they are actually the huts where the people were sitting and cooking their food and you can also find in within these big layers some chewed bones and some cow dung i mean dung cakes I don't know what kind of dung cakes are these and some unfinished stone tools and some finished stone tools so what we did actually in the, here we went to the zanskars uh, headwaters of uh, zanskars the lower regions of zanskars zanskar is the major tributary of the indus indus flows just along the contact of this pink is ladakh batholith or uh, uh, trans himalayan batholith and this is indus molasses and the indus flows along this the contact of these two uh, tectonic units and we wanted to know that what is the contribution of flood sediments of this zanskar which actually drains the southern part i mean uh, uh, molasses himalayas and and we also wanted to know that what is the flood uh, chronology of these deposits so we we studied somewhere around 15 lithlogs i mean uh, locations and these locations they actually look like somewhere sometimes sometimes like this and this is the confluence of zanskar river with indus and most of these slack water deposits swds are actually discovered or they are located at the junction of these two river systems and that is understandable because the slackening of the flood flood uh, rising flood actually takes place inside the smaller tributary where the flood uh, energy goes down often to uh, minimum and these are the very typical locales of the uh, where you can find these slack water deposits and we counted the flood deposits we sampled them for various reasons and these are the luminescence chronology and this is one of the huts which i was talking about the big layer we have carbon 14 dates and we found that 22 large floods i mean these you see we have a cross section at, at this place and these flood deposits were lying somewhere around 11 to 20 meters above the modern river bed right and using the chronology we found that these floods were clustered between 13 to 9k and this was somewhere around when the indian summer monsoon is strengthened to its optimum after the last glacial maxima and this suggests that indian summer monsoon actually penetrated to uh, drier part of the himalaya in in south southern tibet when the uh, climatic optimum took place and if you see the discharge calculation using various manning manning equations we found that the discharges of the peak floods during the early holocene climatic optimum were as high as six times of the modern floods right and we clubbed all the chronologies of these uh, zanskars and the uh, tibetan uh, this indus rivers we found that probably we had in the early holocene and old holocene we have three different clusters of floods the phase 1 was somewhere around 12 14 to 12 k phase 2 was in 10 to 8 k and phase 3 was 7 to 4 k and this these were the 
uh, when phases when the flood frequencies were higher. And the interesting part of this story is this that these are the human herds. And the human presence was increasing when the flood frequencies were also higher. And it is only during the later part of the Holocene when we are finding most number of the herds. That means the human presence in Ladakh actually increased during the early middle part or middle to late Holocene when the flood frequencies were also higher. And these, you can see, this is the Pangongso data of how it all from the Chinese side. And this is basically a deuterium of leaf wax. And this leaf wax data suggests, suggests that just around 12K or so, this Indian summer monsoon contribution to Lake, Lake Pangongso was increased. And that is when the flood frequencies was, were also higher. And this indicates that floods in Indus and at least in the upper catchment of the Indus are controlled by the Indian summer monsoon. And that is when the inbound human migration probably also takes place. And another part, when we compared the flood, uh, flood histories with the Eastern Asian, East Asian monsoon dominated Himalaya, Yellow and Yangtze, and these rivers, many of these rivers, we find that these rivers actually were experiencing the high frequency floods when the Indus were actually depleting. So this is a there is a seesaw kind of a relationship between the ISM or Indian summer monsoon and, and the East Asian summer monsoon. This actually, when you see the modern uh, instrument and instrumental data, this remains the same. This that's why our story is also suggesting that the modern relationship between the ISM and the East Asian summer monsoon actually may go back to Holocene. Uh, it can be extendable. To Holocene. So this was uh, some uh, one part of the story, and another part of this story was the uh, provenance of sediment. We find in, we we dated a lot of zircons separated detritus zircons separated from the flood deposit, and we found that sanskar is the major contributor in the in the flood deposit as a, a, a flood sediments. Therefore, the hotspot of the erosion in the Indus catchment, in the upper part of the Indus catchment, actually lies in the Zanskars or uh, lies in the higher Himalayan crystallines itself. And this is very important uh, conclusion to be confirmed. Uh, the conclusion says that we all know that in the better, better part of the Himalaya, it's, it is the higher Himalayan crystalline, the crystalline core of the Himalaya being eroded most. And this erosion is being driven by the strengthening of the summer monsoon. And what our finding is suggesting that this is this stands true for the dry part of the Himalaya as well. And when we go to the Brahmaputra, in the eastern uh, tributary, in the major tributary that is Yangtze, Yarlung, Sanko, and this is that this is the profile of the Sanko River, and this is the Sanko Gorge, and these are the places where we sampled. As soon as the river profile loses its gradient, we can see that most of the deposits, uh, flood deposits, are now located. And when we dated them, these deposits, and and trying to try to make their uh, uh, estimate their flood flood uh, this discharges, we found that around the middle Holocene, around three k or little more than four k floods, these floods were as high as the magnitude of 10 to the power 7 cumics. And this actually qualifies these floods in Brahmaputra or the Sanko to be called as the mega floods. And these are a few of the rarest floods that occur on the uh, face of the earth. So Brahmaputra actually, because of its geomorphology and its interaction with the Indian summer monsoon, is vulnerable to the largest of the large floods in, in the Himalaya. And that is being explained by uh, the, the, this work. And we did a lot of uh, this uh, isotopic fingerprinting, and of course, the, the lithic fragments and the, all the petrology related to provenance fingerprinting. We found that the floods were actually originated on Tibetan Plateau. And these floods were originated on Tibetan Plateau due to the uh, glob or the breaching of larger larger lakes that were glacial dam lakes or the moraine dam lakes. And these 
running water or gushing water exudes lot of material sediments from the uh, crystalline core or the sanko gorge and the material was finally deposited at the uh, himalayan front and these floods were actually middle holocene floods when the indus was depleting these floods were of the mega flood category and you can see that order of magnitude difference in the flood deposits and that is now to conclude we found that large floods of 10 to power 4 cumex in ladakh occurred during the wetter phases of holocene actually holocene climatic optimum and that's when the human activity also increases there and these floods are largely eroding the high himalayan crystalline core the floods in northeastern himalaya that is sanko and uh, brahmaputra during the holocene were of the mega flood category originated in tibet and exhumed the deeper rocks in the northeastern synthaxis thus now with all the modern flood deposits modern flood data of 2013 and the paleo flood deposits paleo flood records we now know where are the damage zones that are likely to occur in himalaya when we when we have the floods like 2013 and the larger floods therefore the damage zones in the setting like himalaya are predictable and we also now know better informed that what is the water and sediment routing and erosion hotspots in himalaya when these kinds of floods occur so all we need is a is a better informed policies and the watchfulness and my signing off message will be that global geoscience organizations like pages info iubs must contribute to global south in terms of understanding these kinds of extremes thank you so much Thank you, uh, Pradeem. This is a very interesting um, talk. So now the floor is open for questions. We, Pradeem, we have one question. Now we go straight for the questions, OK? And uh, I don't know if you can read, but I can read out the question. The relationship between the flood and the human occupation is very interesting. Could it be possible that the human occupation was there, but the flood? have eroded the evidence for it. This is, yes, of course, this is just a statistics uh, of finding the, because you see the flood stacks are there and they, they preserve the story of the larger occurring floods. The smaller floods, they do not, they are not preserved there. The floods that are smaller there, smaller in magnitude. So larger and larger successive floods are preserved. And very interestingly, in one of the sections we find that over the thousand period, thousand year time scales span, we have three floods, three uh, human hearts. And this explains that the people were actually using these rivers, banks and flood plains continuously over the period of thousand years. And they, they were exploiting the geomorphology and river, uh, river hydrology. So yes, you are right that some part of the story may not be there, but whatever we have, the statistically suggests that middle middle to late Holocene probably uh, is the, the time when we, we we have larger density of uh, occurrences of these earths, and that's what that's how I relate to human presence. Thank you, Pratim. I I actually have a, a, a more technical question. These sure. for this very fast the um, deposit sediment, I I I would imagine that the bleaching will be an issue. And you seem to get a very uh, good uh, OSL dating there. Right. Is that, uh, could, could you say a few words about that? Yes. And uh, it's a very, I mean, very uh, understandable question to, that can be uh, in anybody's mind. And uh, the thing is this, you see this, I, I, I talked about the slack water deposits and slackening of the water sediment. These are the deposits that occur in suspension. These are the suspended load of the floods. And they are deposited at the shallowest part of the uh, basin where, where the slackening occurs. And this is the reason we believe that these are the most bleached part of the flood deposits. And that is the reason we, we are actually able to get the good chronology out of these. Yes, in the northeastern part, we had we struggled to get the good chronology. And that is that is the reason that we could get only few ages. You can see that large number of older ages of all, all, also published by Americans in Oregon Group. But we are we are now very sure that we have some some ways to understand that whether the sediments are bleached or not. You can you can actually relate the ages or the paleo paleo doses with the 
luminescence intensities. And that's what we did. And there are several other statistical uh, treatments that is done to the data to, to, to actually get the best age out of it. So there is no, that, yeah. there is no last word in it. But again, as I said, that this is the best uh, to the time actually. Okay, thank you. Now, another question is coming. So, um, uh, very nice talk. I'm just inquiring about the reason why we have an out of phase in flood frequency between the East Asian monsoon and the Indian monsoon over the Holocene. Actually, these are the two, two systems that draw moisture from two different pools. Indian summer monsoon largely comes from the Arabian Sea and the western part of the Indian Ocean, whereas the Eastern Asian monsoon draws a large part of its uh, moisture from the Pacific. And these are the two different pools, I believe, and these are the, these are the things which actually are operating at different time scales in terms of heating. And uh, I may not be reaching out uh, perfectly in this question, but I believe that the two, the reason behind the, uh, I mean, the two different pools supporting the two different moisture systems uh, is the reason. Okay, All right, thank you. Uh, another um, question, uh, great talk, thank you. I wonder why inbound human migration took place when Himalaya was drier, was the environment suitable for human occupation when the climate was drier? Actually, that is the take home message. The large part of the drier Himalaya, when it starts experiencing the flood, it becomes the greener pastures. And these are the times when large number of wars occurred to annex the uh, Ladakh Himalaya, historically going. And that is, the, that is actually true that uh, modern times, it's, it's a hostile climate kind of climate. But in the, la, in the large, I mean, early part of the Holocene, when climatic optimum was there and flood frequencies were higher, I believe that these systems were much greener. And we have that data from the Pengongso, from Chinese side, how at all, where the leaf wax data is suggesting that vegetation and their pollen data also, that suggests that this Ladakh was greener. And we believe that aridity in this part of the Ladakh or Southeast Tibet is very young. I mean, it is less than 2000 years old. And uh, Pengongso data suggests very nicely there. Because the salinity okay. in Pengongso is as, as young as late Holocene. So it is uh, relatively uh, drier um, yes. you know, compared to, okay, right. Uh, very interesting, right. Okay, any more questions and uh, in the audience uh, or you are still digesting what Pradeem uh, told us? Okay, um, it looks that we are, time is up and we now um, have to end this um, plenary session. And uh, uh, Pradeem, thank you very much again for this very thank exciting you, um, and It was um, very nice talk. interacting with you and it, it is my honor that you, you, you chaired the session, sir. Right, and uh, another thing I just want to say that this is very interesting and uh, you, uh, we could uh, find a way to share the publications that you mentioned yes. with yes. our um, audience. I think this is the way that uh, having this online meeting and uh, you know, um, losing the opportunity to talk to you in person. Yes. So let's, yes. let's do that. And uh, there's, yes. I, I'm sure the pages will have a way of uh, getting this uh, shared or, or interested um, participants or in the audience please send uh, uh, Pradeem an uh, email. I'm sure he will be happy to send you the, to share the publications. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you again. And thank you for the team um, to make this a successful and session. Thank you. 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 Th